This is the sound of Kalmykia. Throat singing in the steppe or ritual chanting in the temple. I'm attending a ceremony at the Golden Temple of Elista and getting to know a piece of Asia in Europe. Would you have thought? We were here in Europe, in the steppe, with former nomad people, with very exotic songs. Welcome to Kalmykia. I've made my way to the southeasternmost part of Europe. Kalmykia is an autonomous republic of the Russian Federation, located between the Caucasus and the Caspian Sea. The golden abode of Buddha's Shakyamuni is in the capital, Ilista. It's the most important Buddhist site in the region. Built in 2005, the temple complex with its pagodas, stupas and prayer wheels is the nation's cultural center. Kalmykia is the only Buddhist region in Europe. Some 160,000 Buddhists live here. The statue of Buddha is the highest in Europe. It's nine meters tall. The Dalai Lama sought out the location of the temple when he was visiting. The Lama Telo Tulku Rinpoche has been the spiritual leader of the Kalmykian Buddhists since 1992. What we would like to achieve is happiness among people. What is the purpose of life? What is the meaning of life? The purpose of life is to be happy. The meaning of life is happiness. Whether believer or non-believer, every sentient being wants to be happy. The temple is open 24-7 and there are ceremonies every day. I listen to the monks reciting mantras. Kalmykia has been Buddhist for about 400 years. Buddhism is not just a religion, it's a way of life. And when I say way of life, it's part of one's culture. As being born a Kalmyk, being part of this, a citizen of this republic, their culture is associated with the Buddhist culture. So therefore, Buddhism is very important uh, for the people of Kalmykia, whether they are a believer in Buddhism or not. The step lies just beyond the city. I advance on a camel as once the ancestors of the Kalmyks, the Oirat Mongols did. The nomadic people first arrived in the region in the 17th century. They lived in portable yurts. Actually, it's not as comfortable as it may look like, so I'm really glad that I can get off the camel right now. <laughs> Most Kalmyk men used to be involved in herding. Erdni is a student who comes from a family of nomads. Traditionally, we've lived with camels, horses and sheep. When we move on to the next place with the animals, then we pack our yurts and everything that we have on the camel. It's like a car. <laughs> Very few Kalmyks live like nomads these days. I'm visiting a small museum village not far from Elista. Giliana Bachayeva shows me how the nomads used to live. The entire family would live in the portable tents. Cooking and sleeping would both take place here. There was a smoke hole at the top. The Oirats were already Buddhists. There was an altar in every tent. 
People would bow down to the gods and pray, and they would always make a donation of cookies or candy for the dead in the afterlife so that they had something to eat. <laughs> Music is very important for the Kalmyks. I meet Vladimir Karuyev in the steppe. He's an overtone star in Kalmykia. In overtone singing, the singer uses his or her vocal cords to create more than one tone at the same time. This technique for creating tones is ancient and comes from our ancestors. It was also used to sing the epic poem. This has a very important meaning and teaches us a lot. It goes back to the time of shamanism. It's very important for us to maintain these traditions. It's also important for our future, because we have to rely on our culture. We have to know our history, so that we can continue as a people with our culture and our knowledge. It sounds so exotic and interesting, I of course also want to try it out. <laughs> no wonder that it's hard. It usually needs years of practice. The breathing technique is important and also how you use your tongue. It's nearly impossible to get a really nice sound like you did, but it does something with you. I don't know what, but it does something with you when you use the whole body to, to breathe and to make the sound, and it makes something with you, which is nice. The Kalmyks were persecuted in the 20th century. During the Stalin era, Buddhism was repressed. The temples were destroyed. Many Kalmyks were deported to Siberia. But there was a Buddhist revival after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And today, Buddhism is omnipresent. The first new temple was built in the early 1990s in front of the gates of Elista. This was a symbol of religious renaissance and a symbol for the fact that one can't take away from the Kalmyks their sense of belonging and faith despite persecution and deportation. They never gave up hope. And because of that, because of that hope, because of that will, that strong will, to preserve their identity, their traditions, their culture, that they were able to bring that back after being in exile for 13 years and to secretly preserve that. And when their time came to have religious freedom, freedom of consciousness, that they were able to pass this to the younger generation. There's a museum in the main temple of Elista that gives an insight into the Buddhist traditions of the Kalmyks. Gailina Aydarova explains to me why the temple complex is so special. 
It was the Dalai Lama who suggested that there should be statues of the most important teachers of Tibetan Buddhism here. They go by the name of Pandit. Around the temple, there are 17 statues of the teachers of the famous Buddhist University of Nalanda. This is almost the only place in the whole world where there's a pantheon for all the masters of this university. It existed between the 5th and 12th centuries. It was the biggest of its time. The temple is also surrounded by 108 prayer wheels, which are filled with thousands of mantras. The idea is that both the body and the mind should be set in motion when these are spun, for better karma. There are such wheels everywhere, even on Lenin Square in the town center, where there's plenty of life after sunset. When it's not too hot, the Kalmyks meet to play chess, a national sport that's even taught in schools. Some 100,000 people live in Ilista, a third of the whole population of Kalmykia. <laughs> Families gather together on Buddhist holidays. They go to the temple together and attend ceremonies. We also pray at home. We have an altar and pray on every holiday, usually every day. My grandma lights a candle every day and prays. This is a place where you uh, change your battery when you feel yourself much more energized, then you feel much more powerful after visiting this place. When I visit this temple and meet the lamas, I'm filled with such a sense of peace and well-being. All I can feel is that everyone should have this sense of peace and good all over the world. Today is Buddha's birthday. Many monks have traveled from afar to celebrate. A central element of Buddhism is reciting mantras. The believers have to bring offerings. This is a sign of wanting good for all people. The temple of Elista was financed entirely through donations. It was a very impressive experience, very calm, peaceful, even if I hadn't understood anything. After the ceremony, the believers seek the Lama's blessing. And they make offerings and donations to honor Buddha. a bridge between East and West. And we have a very important role in bringing these two different continents or countries or you know, different ethnicities, different groups, different ideology, bringing them more closer through understanding, through dialogue,
Kalmykia is a piece of Asia in Europe. Here in Kalmykia, I've once again become aware of how big Europe actually is. And considering the Buddhist tradition here, also how diverse it is.